Thanks everybody for coming. My name is Andrew Rubin. I work for NYU Langone Health. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Affairs for the health system. Uh, basically that means I run their outpatient clinical operations. I also host a weekly uh, radio show on Sirius XM called Healthcare Connect. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, I was asked by a, a good friend of mine from the Danish consulate in New York to host, moderate a panel on happiness, which I think is a topic that everybody in this room wants to hear more about. And I think that the, uh, the team at the, at the consulate put together probably one of the, the best panels you could ever find probably in the world to talk about it. So I'm going to, I'm going to introduce people, and I'm going to start with uh, Jeff Sachs, who uh, personally I've never actually met, but it's a, a privilege to get to meet today because uh, he's pretty much at the forefront of, uh, of, of many things in uh, sustainable development, economic policy. Uh, he's the director for sustainable development at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He is uh, a university professor at Columbia University, and for people who work for academia, that's pretty much the highest rank you can have as a professor uh, in the world, certainly, certainly at Columbia as well. And he's a special advisor at the United Nations, uh, and he's known as a world leader in economic and sustainable development. On my right here, this guy's pretty cool. Um, not that you're not, Jeff, but. Uh, <laughs> what can I do? Mike Wickham, he, um, he, he, he has a, a very interesting background. He's the founder and CEO of the Happiness Research Institute, right? So who gets to spend all their day running a foundation where you're talking about being happy? This guy does. And, and to, to prove it, he is a New York Times bestselling author who uh, wrote, I had to practice this. I actually, I did have to practice Practices, wrote a book. Uh, it's called The Little Book of Huga. And if you're Danish, you can make it sound much better than I just did. But uh, it, uh, Huga is essentially a form of happiness. I'm going to let him explain it to you. And I'm excited to tell you I'm getting an autographed copy on the way out. There's some books on the table on the way out. So I encourage you all to pick it up. It's printed in 30 languages around the world, a million copies. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a pretty cool book. And then, uh, I know this is Google, but I still use note cards, I'm sorry. Uh, they <laughs> offered me an iPad, they just don't, they don't work in this forum. Last is Catalina Cernica. Uh, she is a project director uh, for the Health and Happiness Studies at the LEO Innovation Lab. We have a lot of uh, guests, uh, again, on my left from the LEO Innovation Lab. It's a part of a, an organization uh, which is part of the LEO Foundation. Uh, which is a very large uh, philanthropic organization based in Denmark. They fund a lot of research in healthcare. They are independent of Leo Pharmaceuticals, which is a huge dermatologic pharmaceutical company in Denmark around the world. Uh, and they, their mission, uh, I'll let, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Catalina talk a little bit of, uh, more about that. But let's just get started. And I'm gonna start with you, Mike, because I think this is a question it's not as obvious to everybody as it sounds, but you know, what is happiness? How, how do we define happiness? And who better than you to answer that question right. for us? So I think one useful definition of happiness is uh, the experience of joy, contentment, um, satisfaction with life, uh, combined with the sense that our life is good, worthwhile, and meaningful. Now, that is, of course, a, a very wide uh, definition uh, and complex. Um, so usually what we do when we work with happiness is we break it down and look at the different components that happiness consists of. And it's also what we do with other complex phenomena. If we talk about how is the US economy doing, we also break that down and look at different components. We talk about GDP, we talk about growth, we talk about inflation, unemployment rates, and that gives us a language to talk about how is the US economy doing. So that's also what we need to do with happiness. So when we look at happiness, we look at sort of overall life satisfaction, taking a step back, looking at your life, considering the worst possible life you could live, the best possible life you could live, um, and where you feel you stand right now. Um, another dimension is what kind of emotions do people experience on, on a daily basis, both positive and negative ones. Uh, and thirdly, there is a, a, a dimension that sort of covers what Aristotle believed the good life was, and he believed the good life was the meaningful life. So that, that, that gives us the ability to, to sort of dissect happiness. And, and all of those things are, of course, very subjective. Um, and I think 
that's not a challenge, that's a good thing. Uh, we study other phenomena that are subjective. We study depression, depression, we study stress, we study loneliness. All of those things about how we as individuals experience the world. Uh, so the same with, with happiness. Um, I don't think it's more difficult to study positive emotions compared to negative emotions. And also, I mean, to me, the, the only person here that can tell us whether Catalina is happy or not is Catalina. So it is a metric that is person-centric or patient-centric uh, that allows Catalina's view on her life to be the core of what we're trying to understand. So Jeff, how, why, why, are we why are we talking about this now? I mean, it's, it's, I know the UN, has, you, which you're a co-author on, puts out a world report on happiness for many years. Denmark was, was at the, uh, number one on the list. I think you slipped to number two this year. Still a, a very good ranking, <laughs> uh, considering the, the US continually falls uh, towards the bottom. Why are we talking about this? And, and how are we even measuring something like this? Well, we've been talking about happiness for at least 2,300 years uh, since Aristotle wrote uh, Nicomachean Ethics, where he said uh, eudaimonia or happiness is, is the highest goal of individuals. And he wrote another book, very good book, called The Politics, where he said uh, eudaimonia is the highest goal of our community life also. That's what politics should be about. Let me ask you, is politics making you happy these days? Uh, or is it making you incredibly depressed? Uh, it's making me uh, probably crazy uh, at this point. Uh, and um, that was one of the insights of Aristotle, that uh, your well-being depends on your social conditions, uh, not only your personal income, uh, uh, and uh, personal conditions, but whether your president is a nut or whether the government is honest or corrupt or uh, other things like that. So talking about happiness is a quite natural thing, but for 100 years, especially in this country, we stopped talking about happiness and we talked instead about uh, gross domestic product. Uh, we talked about money. And the assumption was at various levels of sophistication from unbelievably crude to a little more sophisticated that your money was the measure of your happiness. And that has been American culture as well. Then it was noted uh, around uh, 1984 by a very pioneering uh, professor at Penn, Richard Easterlin, that when people were asked about their happiness compared to their per capita incomes, uh, the US had been increasing per capita income for decades, but didn't seem like happiness was rising. And that basic idea is what motivates the kinds of studies that are underway that we have to get beyond money as the measure of all things. And in the United States, it's pretty clear we have declining happiness and rising income at the same time. So there's a real puzzle and challenge in this country. And more generally, it's pretty clear what the inventor of gross domestic product said repeatedly was one of my teachers also, Simon Kuznets, Nobel laureate. Uh, it's not a measure of well-being. Stop it. Stop using it. It's a measure of economic output. It's not a measure of well-being. But we're obsessed in our country. Will GDP rise 3.1% or 2.9%? And so we've gone a little mad in the United States, uh, way overboard on this, and we haven't asked about happiness. Well, it turns out you can ask about happiness. You ask, are you happy? Uh, and you do that with various levels of sophistication and you find out all sorts of interesting things. So that's why we're so doing it. So when you it. find out, and I'm sorry, I was gonna I, hold, I have a question for you, but when you find out the answer to that question in this UN report that Americans are actually not happy and Danes are, relatively speaking, much happier, what do you do about that? I mean, it, it, to me, the data's great, the report's extremely useful, but what are we gonna do with that? I mean, it can't be as simple as getting a new president. Well. Hey, <laughs> now I'm happy. <laughs> now we're talking. That was a, that was a softball. That was a softball okay. question. Okay, uh, 
Gallup has done a really wonderful job over the, the last uh, dozen years or so of doing an annual survey. And they ask a very specific question uh, that uh, Mike referred to. Uh, it's called the Cantrell Ladder. So the question which each of you can now take in your minds is, uh, imagine that life is a ladder and the zero rung on the ladder is the worst life you can imagine for yourself and the top rung, the tenth rung, is the best life you can imagine for yourself. Where do you stand on that ladder of life? So Gallup does uh, that question, uh, asks that question to about 1,000 people, each in 150 countries, so about 150,000 people. And we report that once a year, and that's where Denmark's always at or near the top. And the social democratic countries of Northern Europe are always uh, at the top. The United States is by no means at the bottom. We are 19th in the ranking out of 150 countries this year. For the US these days, hey, that's pretty good. Uh, we're still in the top 20, uh, maybe not for long, but we're still in the top 20. Um, but we've been going down, and clearly the mood uh, is bad. Uh, and we also found this year, by the way, that uh, tabulating mood, which is were you worried yesterday, were you anxious yesterday, were you angry yesterday, that is soaring in the world right now over the last 10 years. That's really about the most alarming finding of the report, in my view, of uh, th this year. So each year we do an analysis. Uh, what accounts for this ranking? Can we find the correlates? Can we find the uh, variables that seem to explain the differences? And that's where something can be done. John Helliwell, professor at University of British Columbia, leads that analysis each year. He does a wonderful job. And very, uh, uh, speaking, uh, very, um, succinctly, I, I hope. Uh, the factors that count are your per capita income. That definitely matters. Higher income, better. But with what we call a declining marginal utility of income, more and more doesn't help that much after a certain point. Second is your health, both mental and physical. Third is your social support. Do you have friends? By the way, Aristotle, chapter 8, Nicomachean Ethics, 2,300 years ago, he said, have friends to be happy. <laughs> Smart man, uh, good advice. That makes a big, big difference. Fourth, do you feel you have your life in your hands, that you have the freedom to make important life decisions? Uh, fifth, are you and is your society generous? So various uh, indicators of generosity. Sixth, can you trust your government. Uh, is it corrupt or is it honest? One of the reasons why Denmark rates so high is that Danish people trust their government. And I would say the government delivers. And I was uh, saying earlier that, to my mind, the metric of this, if you've watched the wonderful television series uh, Borgen, which was the House of Cards version for Denmark of Danish politics, the worst thing that happens in Borgen is uh, that the prime minister uses his office credit card for a personal expense. <laughs> he, he, he ends up losing office, whereas, uh, of, of course, uh, in House of Cards, uh, the president, among many other things, pushes the young reporter in front of a train, which, uh, as Donald Trump already said, he could do in broad daylight shoot someone on Fifth Avenue, and his supporters, no doubt, would love him for it. Um, so that's the difference of politics. We don't like our government very much. It's pretty clear in the data where the Danes like the government, and they're happy about it, and I'm unhappy about it. So that's, that's, So when you ask what can you do about it, Probably the main message of this study is that social democracy is really a, a good system. Uh, it provides security, it provides a, a measure of decency, it keeps inequalities low, and America's winner-take-all, money's-everything society is really going overboard. Catalina, you uh, have done a lot of research on patients living with chronic conditions. 
So based on you know what you've just heard from from Jeff and Mike, how, how how do you think how would you define happiness? How would the people you study define their happiness, <laughs> knowing that they're facing potentially huge obstacles in their life? And I think the data that you're going to talk about yep. shows some some pretty interesting results. I think there are two layers to um, to this answer, because from an individual perspective, health is a um, massive driver of happiness. So if you have to live with a chronic condition, and in our case, we started with uh, dermatology conditions like psoriasis or eczema, um, your happiness is defined by how you manage your condition and the impact that condition has on your uh, everyday living. So we see that uh, stress, loneliness, are really impacted by living with um, with a skin condition, and it is definitely um, having a big impact on your mental health. But I think what is interesting in our work is that, um, like you said, I, I work for, um, for an innovation lab uh, within a pharma company, and healthcare systems don't like subjective. You know, they don't care if Catalina is unhappy, they will say, your blood pressure is fine, go away. So we like objective stuff. What we do, we want to actually challenge that and say, get inspired by uh, the work of around happiness and say, what if we apply <coughs> these methodologies in healthcare? What are we going to learn? And to give you an example, uh, and think about how you would answer uh, this question. Um, a clinically driven um, quality of life uh, survey for people living with a, a skin condition will ask the question, has your skin impacted your leisure or social activities in the last four weeks. Or if you look at overall well-being methodologies, you will ask, have you felt alone? Or are you lacking companionship? Which actually breaks down the, this kind of focus on has your skin or your diabetes or other chronic condition has an impact on your, on your life, or just trying to understand people's lives and then analyze the data and see what is income and what is living with a chronic condition or the power of your, uh, of your community. And that, that, in that way, we actually challenge the way we look at classic health-related um, measures, and we want to bring happiness-related measures into healthcare. You know, being in a, in a, in a US audience, uh, you can imagine a lot of people might be confused why a pharmaceutical company as you describe, would be, because it's not, it's the Leo Innovation Lab is actually separate from the pharmaceutical company, but why are, why are, why is the foundation doing this kind of work? What's, what's the goal of this, of this group? And is this something that you're going to be trying to apply to other conditions? Uh, U.S., a big problem, mental health, addiction, mm -hmm. areas where our population here in the United States is struggling. Yeah. Is, is there a role for this? And, and, and what is the foundation actually trying to do? I think it would be great if you know, we would start looking at healthcare policies the same way we're starting looking at other policies and actually bring these well-being measures uh, to influence our decisions. Our, our work, so it's kind of, uh, like you said, you know, I am part of uh, Leo Innovation Lab, and because we are owned by a pharma company who is under uh, Leo Foundation, like you mentioned, we are quite lucky because we really have a patient-centric approach and we can look um, for the long-term investment, not the immediate investment. So that's one factor. The other factor is that, uh, and my boss is here, so I have to be careful <laughs> with, this, uh, with this answer. Um, it is that, funny enough, our project started as a small internal exercise because we focus in Leo Innovation Lab in what you would call developing digital therapeutics. So we were looking for measures of how we can measure the impact uh, of our specific digital project on the well-being of people living with chronic conditions. And that's how we ended up developing this, uh, this project. But as I said, because we are very much focused on doing what's right for the patients, we saw the potential of the project and we just said, okay, Let's see if we can uh, publish our own world happiness report for people living with psoriasis and then start from there. And what we're trying to do now is actually 
set up an independent uh, foundation that is going to take this uh, work further and really advocate for looking at the health of people in a different way and bringing well-being, you know, the scary subjective uh, stuff into how we manage health. What were you going to say, Mike? One of the reasons why I'm, I'm excited about the, the, the study is also that we're starting to use happiness metrics within healthcare. Yeah. And I think one of the issues we have in a lot of countries is that we've been using the wrong metrics that leads to wrong decisions and wrong priorities. And I think that's why we see in a lot of countries that we have gotten richer without getting happier. And I think the core question now, not just for the US, but also for countries like Denmark, is how do we convert wealth into well-being? How do we invest into quality of life? And I think yeah. we get some answers where we start to map inequalities in well-being. So the World Happiness Report usually uh, focuses on the average, national averages. And usually Denmark and the other Nordic countries come out in top when we look at a national average. But the 2016 report uh, I, was, I was really happy with because for the first time there was a global ranking looking at the distribution in well-being, the inequality in well-being. And I think that's where we need to address our uh, challenges in the coming years to, to bridge the happiness gap we see in a lot of countries. Because obviously, if you have a disease, you are less happy than the average citizen in that given country. But why do we see so large variations in that happiness gap when we look at a specific a uh, certain disease. I think that's yep. where the, the study is really exciting. What, what, what would, it, what would uh, it look like in this country to you? And I, I'm setting you up because I saw an interview that you had done where you I, someone asked you, what would America look like if, uh, in, 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 as compared with Denmark, some of these concepts? And you gave an interesting answer. I'm going to see if you get, I'm going to tell you what I'm you not said. sure which, which <laughs> answer it was. <laughs> but uh, maybe I said something like... Um, what you said was imagine... Uh, Bernie Sanders right. as, yeah. your, as your president. That's what, that's what some of the concepts you're describing would look like in distribution of income, distribution of healthcare services, and, and things of that nature. Right. Okay, so, so maybe that's what I very, said was... That's uh, a good point, by the way. Yeah. Could I jump in just for... Yeah, oh, but go I, on. Yeah, sure. because I think maybe what I said, and this might have to be edited out, but I think I said Denmark <laughs> is, is Bernie Sanders' wet dream. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and and um, in Denmark, it's interesting to see because here Bernie Sanders is progressive. He's a socialist, and AOC is a socialist. In Denmark, they're common sense. They're not progressives. They are talking sense. And also, I, probably in the same interview, or at least a lot of Ameri American journalists will ask me, you know, how can you be so happy in the Nordic countries? You pay so high taxes. I say, maybe we are happy because we're paying a lot in tax. Because nine out of 10 Danes will say we're happy to pay our taxes because we see them as investments in quality of life. We see them as investments in healthcare, in mental healthcare, in great infrastructure, in education. That brings happiness to citizens. Uh, and I think it's interesting to look at the average relationship there is, as Jeff described before, between GDP per capita and uh, happiness. And there is those diminishing marginal returns. But there is also countries that are above the line, countries that are relatively good at converting the wealth into well-being. Denmark has a lower GDP per capita than the US, but higher happiness levels because there is investment in healthcare, in mental healthcare, in infrastructure, in education. So that I mean, I get it. Bernie Sanders is more than welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, what were you going to say? It, it's uh, exactly right. Uh, I, every word you said. Our uh, discussion in the United States is really messed up, in part because we have uh, really nasty people leading it, like the president. I'll leave him aside, but uh, Rupert Murdoch and the business press. So the Wall Street Journal is a really deranged newspaper. And today it ran another story, Bernie Sanders create socialism. What does socialism mean? Venezuela. This is, this is the meme of uh, this election cycle. It shows how we're living in a kindergarten world, by the way. These people are idiots, I'm sorry to say. Uh, their, their level of knowledge is infantile. But Bernie Sanders represents basically mainstream social democratic ideas. So you put Bernie Sanders uh, in Denmark, like you said, it's 
completely the mainstream. Is it Venezuela? No, it's not Venezuela. By the way, the United States is trying to destroy Venezuela, probably as a campaign prop. Uh, so it's not just that Venezuela is collapsing. The United States has put every uh, sanction possible, closing, grabbing reserves, and so forth. I know I'm taking us away from this. But, just a little bit. But, but, the, <laughs> but, but the reason is we're in a mind game in this country where the richest, nastiest people are trying to tell the American people, you will not be happy. Do not be fooled. Having guaranteed health care, that would make you unhappy. Do not be fooled. Uh, having access to quality education, that would not make you happy. Do not be fooled. That's the route to disaster. And what Bernie Sanders is, he's our one politician in this country that just speaks mainstream social democracy, which is the mainstream of Scandinavia, which is the mainstream of why Scandinavian countries are so happy. Uh, because life is not insecure every day. Because people aren't at the edge of falling off the cliff. Because if you've had an experience like I did when I had an eyelash stuck, I had to go into, a, duck into a clinic in Sweden a couple of years ago, and they plucked out whatever they had to do. And, and uh, I said, where do I sign my insurance? No, 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 it's free. Go, go. <laughs> Don't worry. It's a different kind of life. It's not anxiety that you're just rubbish or you're disposable or your anxieties are your own problem. Don't bother us. I'm Mr. Trump. Don't bother us. Don't bother me. I'm in it to make money for my family. This is how our politics are so terribly distorted right now and why this is a very relevant discussion because unhappiness is coming from high inequality, from a lot of anxiety, from poor people not being taken care of at all. In fact, told literally, go away. We don't want you. There's no room. And of course, it's making everyone really uh, very high anxiety and we have many, many symptoms of it, rising suicide rates, rising depressive disorder, uh, rising addiction rates. It's actually not just a footnote right now. It's a serious matter. But what bothers me is how the truth is so infantilely distorted now by the uber-rich, mega-rich, uh, nasty, right wing in this country. And that's where we're really falling down and w where we really have a big crisis. Anyway, Bernie's the only one that gets it really right. But it's completely mainstream so the, I'm gonna European have, I'm politics. Gonna, uh, we'll talk to the, the Google team on the way out. Uh, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll, we'll debate Bernie's health care platform at a different. Uh, oh, I've had, I'm uh, ready to debate it right I'll, now, if you want. Uh, no. <laughs> Medicare for all, exactly so, right. So, so, so just in case anyone has any uh, questions about that. And, and, and yeah. so am I, but we're not okay. going to do that. All right. Uh, uh, because uh, it'll, it'll take away from the happiness. Yes. <laughs> I think but, it would raise it. <laughs> no, certainly, certainly we, would, we would both fully agree, that, and I know you've studied this having read a lot about you, that uh, finding middle ground is how uh, consensus building and finding middle ground, Obamacare, other things like that, or how you actually move in a, an agenda forward. One comment, because I think um, health inequality is a very important subject, no matter the country. Oh, great. Now, I live in London. You know, we have NHS. It's free for everybody. But we still see that you know, patients or people living with chronic conditions are not necessarily happy. And we have to understand, and from our data, you know, living in Denmark, if you have psoriasis, is not going to make you happy. Actually, and we have a modest start. We have 21 countries in our own happiness report. And actually, Denmark and Norway are mid-table. Um, uh, uh, UK is next to the bottom. You know, it's really hard to live with a chronic condition like psoriasis or eczema in, uh, in the UK. And we have to ask the question, why? You know, actually, people are living in Mexico. Could you substitute any illness, do you think, from the data from that? Or do you think it's unique to It has crisis? to run. It has to run 
you know, specific research for specific chronic conditions. We do know that it creates inequality regardless the, the chronic condition we live in. It's there what we call happiness gaps that are, that are different. But it's definitely a very good question to ask, you know, and actually um, challenge the, the systems. Why is it that, you know, if you live with uh, a uh, chronic condition in, in Denmark, a rather happy country otherwise, you feel isolated. It's almost like, you know, the long tail that it gets very long and we kind of like lose people in the society to their, to their illnesses. And, and you also see a, 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 dis a difference between men and women within those countries as which well. Which is massive, which is, which is very interesting because we actually learn, and this is kind of like uh, going to closer from the government to the um, health um, institutions so like what what are actually you know trying to do to understand well-being we talk a lot about preventative medicine these days but we're kind of and when we talk about well-being we're all thinking of gym and diet and that's it you know and cool gadgets but we're not thinking about you know well-being as a holistic definition of your life and what you do with your um, with your health and with your uh, social uh, uh, health and all the aspects so it's it's very important to say okay so let's start looking at it and ask the questions and the same way the world uh, happiness report asks questions and say why why are women much uh, less unhappy than men when they live with a chronic condition? Is it because the, you know, the classic pressures, you have to look pretty, you have to look good all the time? Is it because we actually react differently? We were talking about, um, at the beginning, about you know, the, um, the positive and the negative effects that you have in, um, in research of well-being. And we see that women are much more responsive to the negatives. But our, you know, 99% of media talks about how you should be positive and how you should focus on the three steps to, whatever, achieve um, happiness. While the data actually shows that for women living with a chronic condition will be probably more effective to acknowledge that you will feel down and stressed and your self-esteem is going to be affected. <clears throat> this is how you can uh, manage it better. And by the way, it is true from our data at least that men are most affected by pain. That's what takes them. <laughs> you know, no, yeah, yeah, you know, all the emotional stuff, if it's pain, it's really bad. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I thought another interesting pattern in, in the data was one explanation for, for, for happiness gaps. So when, when patients are, are severely less happy than the average citizen, we could see if patients felt their doctor didn't fully understand the mental impact psoriasis have on their well-being, there was a happiness gap of 21%. Yeah. If the doctor understands the mental impact, then the happiness gap was only 3%. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the reasons why I really like happiness metrics, is that it, I think, honors the definition of health that the World Health Organization is using. So health is not just the absence of disease, but yeah. health is a good physical, mental, and social well-being. And I think we address that, and we capture that yeah. with, with happiness uh, metrics. And also coming back to, to what you said earlier, across different diseases. I think that's the real strength of happiness metrics, like the Cantrell ladder, that we can use it as a common currency to look across different diseases and see how do we um, address the different happiness gaps that we see. One of the things we know also from the data is that people with uh, uh, mental illness problems do not get treatment, period. Uh, maybe only a quarter or a third in the US uh, actually will find their way to professional treatment. And worldwide, it's absolutely a dismal, uh, dismally low proportion. And the way that healthcare is delivered here is uh, it's delivered for specific symptoms, for specific diseases, for specific uh, events, not a holistic, uh, a holistic approach to life. So if you're in a poor community in, in this city, uh, you may have many, many social challenges that will never be attended to. Uh, you may find your way to an emergency room uh, fairly frequently and have an acute episode uh, addressed, but the underlying uh, human uh, needs are not addressed, and we don't have a healthcare system 
that actually builds out something more holistically uh, by design. It's very much an intervention-based, specific, acute response system. Yeah. That's my favorite uh, insight from the, from the report, and you're absolutely right. Even you know, in England, they'll tell you, you, don't, you feel a little bit sad, go have a tea, come back in two weeks. Mm -hmm. That's the pretty much treatment you get <laughs> there. Uh, but it's, and I've, I've presented you know, but the insights from our health and happiness studies for a couple of years now, and every time I talk about if people think that their doctor understands the impact a chronic condition has on their mental health, they're going to be happier. Mm -hmm. The reaction I get from the doctor is like, but it's not my job to make them happy. My job is to treat them. So it is, it is, it is as I said, a very big challenge to the system. If we are serious you know, about getting more holistic and more well-being led and not just disease led, that, is, that will require a massive change. It's not only about the healthcare, you know, the hospitals, but it's also your community, social services, what we have in Europe. So, we, you, know. We, you know, here in the United States, we, uh, we had to take a pause uh, for the past two years. We, you know, the, the previous government, previous administration, uh, probably not in the most articulate way, did launch, uh, attempt to launch a massive transformation of our healthcare system in the United States. And it was starting to take hold uh, with all of the inherent inefficiencies of something so massive. In the United States, our healthcare system is 20% of the close to 20% of the economy. So 20 cents of every dollar, it's not spent on you know fuel or food. It's spent on healthcare. That, that's a that's a lot. So uh, you know Obamacare, electronic record transformation. There's a lot of new things happening in this country, and candidly, we've lost. Uh, the past two years of momentum, and uh, and we have two more years to get through. Hopefully, until there'll be an opportunity to 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 start this back up. But everything Jeff has said and you're saying about uh, you know what our doctors are actually able to do. I mean, we put so much pressure on them mm -hmm. to you know see as many patients as they can through the day uh, that we don't give them time. We don't give. I'm the administrator. I'm the bad guy. I don't give them time to ask that question, are you happy? What can I do for you today other than treat this underlying diagnosis and then send you on your way because the next patient's in the room and I gotta go see them. Uh, you know, the, the promise of healthcare reform in this country was to change some of that uh, and it stopped. It's just, you know, all these pilot innovation projects, the government sponsors, New York State, some of the largest innovation projects in the country are in New York State and California and, and they're going. They're literally going nowhere, uh, unfortunately. So again, uh, healthcare uh, is. We've lost the momentum, and we're going to have to see how this plays out over time. We certainly have the infrastructure in place, and I know many, many Danes and 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 uh, people from London who still view our healthcare. We certainly have some of the best technology in the world. Uh, many European physicians, you know, come to the United States to do their research. More healthcare research is done in the United States than any other place in the world combined. So there are a lot of good things about uh, our healthcare system, but we we we've lost our we've certainly lost our way. I think you raise a very good point that's also worth um, worth discussing, which is we've talked about happiness in the context of a doctor and a patient. There's happiness generally in in work, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, some places are happy uh, happy places to work. I hope that's true where we are. Uh, and some places are quite miserable uh, places to work. And since we spend a lot of time uh, in, uh, in work uh, per day, that's a big deal. Uh, so all of these metrics and this evidence is actually something for work organization as well. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's a physician, uh, and at one point uh, several years ago in the university practice she was in, they put a kind of time in motion person to follow her around. Uh, I don't to do that, but to, to, de to determine that it was uh, eight minutes per patient and uh, how many times to the restroom and to go to the lab, and so she quit. Uh, it was uh, so unpleasant, so deep, deprofessionalizing. Uh, they were told these are not patients; they're your clients now. It was really bizarre, uh, but it was, uh, as a more general point, that when we look at happiness, it's not only a direct 
uh, indicator to a minister of finance or something, uh, but it is how healthcare is organized. It's what how our kids uh, are in school, uh, what they learn, uh, what what the classroom is like. Uh, it's actually specific mind training, uh, meditation or mindfulness or compassion uh, training and so forth that can make a big difference. How a workplace is organized, how a city, by the way, is designed so that people can be together. I know in New York, we're just the luckiest in the world to be able to be in a wonderful city where you walk, you see outdoor cafes, you uh, have Central Park. This is a fantastic a part of our well-being in this city. And some cities are so polluted, dangerous to walk, no sidewalks, no green. Of course, people are going to be incredibly unhappy. And when you're in Copenhagen, it's incredible how the city has been reclaimed, has reclaimed itself from the automobile. So now it's a walking, it's a walking everywhere. And by the way, the density of coffee shops in Copenhagen is like I've never seen before <laughs> because every block is at least three or four coffee shops, which to my mind is a definition of happiness, uh, almost, <laughs> almost tautologically. Uh, but it, it does mean we should be thinking about this in all of these different aspects of our social organization. We spend 20% of our GDP on coffee. So, <laughs> so um, a lot of things. Um, We've only been talking about the, the, the one way of the relationship between health and happiness, because you say, why should the doctors care whether they're happy or not? Mm -hmm. They should, because we can see it also impacts longevity. When we look at longitudinal studies where we follow people over time, and there's a lot of studies on this, we can see that people that are happier also have a lower mortality rate, even when we control for health status and a lot of other factors from the beginning of the study. And I completely agree with, with with what Jeff is saying in terms of, of for example, urban design. Mm -hmm. I mean, happiness metrics, when we know what we know from happiness research, the questions are, how do we design our healthcare systems differently? How do we design our policies differently? How do we design workplaces differently and our cities differently? I have a very similar experience to what you do in, in terms of, of how urban planning impacts happiness. Um, one of the cities that invest a lot in infrastructure, but forget to invest in infrastructure for people, but only for cars, in my experience was uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. I was there a couple of years ago, and I was staying 200 meters from the botanical garden, and I wanted to go over there. You couldn't. <laughs> and gave up halfway because there was no pavement. Yeah. And, and so you invest to create cities for cars and not people. And what you're essentially telling your citizens is that if you do not own a car, you are a second-rate citizen. Now, what I like about Copenhagen, where the majority of people cycle to work, majority of students cycle to university, majority of also the cast of Bone, but also the real-life politicians cycle to parliament, the reason they do that is there is investment in infrastructure for pedestrians, for cyclists, that, feel, that makes you feel like you're king and queen of the road. That's what it, it, it needs to get done uh, in, in, in terms to create a city with high mobility. I'd be remiss if I didn't throw this question out to all three of you with the few minutes that I have left. Uh, technology, we're at Google, right? The center of the, of the technology universe. Uh, the, the, I believe it was a UN World Health Report, a uh, happiness report, but certainly Mathieu, as I've read, has said that technology has had a negative impact on the happiness of children in this country. Um, thoughts on that? We have a chapter in this year's report which is uh, putting forward that as, a, as an important hypothesis. I would say it's unsettled. I received a lot of uh, responses to that. Um, it's not my article, but uh, in, in the volume. Uh, but definitely for this was uh, looking at adolescence. What we know in the United States is from around 2009 onward, there is a real epidemic of depression. Uh, and nobody knows exactly what this is coming from, but one hypothesis is that that's uh, when the iPhone uh, came. And what is clear in the data is, of course, our lives have been changed unbelievably in how we spend our day. And the data from uh, this sample of uh, young people was 
something like eight hours a day of uh, screen time on digital devices, sleep collapsing, uh, time with friends collapsing. Uh, and so uh, having friends is doing this. Uh, basically, uh, you're online with your friends, uh, perhaps, but not uh, really uh, interacting with them face to face. I don't know. It's, it's a very big deal because the digital revolution is the biggest change on our planet. I don't think any of us has ever experienced anything like this. You walk down the street, you realize it is a completely fundamental change to how we live our lives. Every single person's carrying their phone or with headphones or uh, somehow plugged in within 10 years. So is this good? Is it really working? Are we creating addictions? Uh, is this serving our humanity or not? I don't know. You guys are in the forefront of it. You, you need to really study this. Um, it's no good just to get faces uh, on the screen to sell advertising. This is a disaster. Uh, we have to know whether this is really good. Potentially, it ought to open up lots of things for us. But is it really the way we're doing it? I don't think we know. Mike, Huga, happiness, technology? Um, we're, we're actually working right now on a report on digital well-being. Um, which will come out in, in the fall, and also because we've been interesting, uh, interested and, and concerned. Uh, and I think what we'll find is probably also that how we use technology has different impacts. If we use technology to become addicted, to you know, lose sleep, if we use technology to become jealous of the wonderful lives that all my friends are living on Facebook, then obviously that will have a negative impact on how I evaluate my life. If we use technology to connect, if we use technology to um, connect across geography, across generations, then there might be hope for technology and, and well-being. Um, also further down the line, at one point we'll get to a, a level where artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence maybe will help us produce early detection when it comes to suicide. If my phone can pick up when I'm depressed or if FaceTime can pick up uh, certain muscles in, in my face that show signs of sadness or, or uh, suicidal thoughts combined with me Googling suicide methods and so on. I think that area uh, is super interested in, in mental health mm -hmm. uh, technology to, to um, maybe not improve happiness, but to reduce uh, misery for, for those that are struggling with life. Interesting uh, debate ahead. So we're gonna open this up for, to, to the audience if there are any questions. So I actually have, a, first of all, uh, great stuff. And to be clear, I'm, I'm a believer. I think what you guys are doing is, is, is great. Um, but I have a, a bit of a challenge for you, which is, um, I feel a little bit unsettled being here in the audience that this feels mildly self-congratulatory in as much as most of the people in this audience, certainly the, the Googlers, we've got really good health insurance. There's free food right out there that any of us could go and eat. I, I wonder if you guys have thoughts of how to make this conversation more inclusive in the sense of people who actually work in the cafeteria and who are working at the security desk, they're not in this room, and how to uh, you know, bring everybody into it and, and let everyone benefit from it? Actually, because I'm, I'm an optimist of technology, I think technology will help bring everybody into this conversation to, to start with. And I know it's a, it's a system problem, but I think it's also becoming aware of the differences we have in income or health status or all the biases that we can get from, from technology usage and actually make sure that everybody's voice is heard. Um, for me, technology actually um, helps us uh, talk to people who suffer from different illnesses that normally wouldn't engage. And actually, social media is helping us reach people who wouldn't otherwise share their stories. And we get to really learn and really, again, kind of like challenge the, the status quo of what we think is 
healthy or happy or what are your problems when you live with, uh, with a condition by trying to, to bring everybody's voices uh, to the table. Thank I you. think it is the uh, essence of uh, one approach to life that uh, society should be inclusive for everybody. Uh, that's not the libertarian idea. Uh, that's not the uh, uh, American idea right now. But in Denmark uh, or uh, many other countries, everybody has the guarantees that allow the inclusion, uh, at least in a material sense. Everybody has decent pay. Everybody has vacation time. We don't have one day of guaranteed vacation time in the United States other than federal holidays, but paid vacation is uh, normal in Northern Europe and in the United States non-existent as a right. And so I think this question that you're asking is really a very basic and important one, which is uh, what does it mean to be inclusive? In the United States, in theory, inclusive means you're on your own, so good luck. Uh, and if you make it, that's great. Uh, and uh, if not, uh, that's tough, but don't bother me. Um, I think what we are all saying is it's not really a way to make anybody happy to have such a, uh, an unequal, high-stress society mm -hmm. that would have you ask a question, a very valid question like that. Uh, but that is our society. It's not an inclusive society. Thank you so much for coming here and speaking with us today. Um, a lot of the things, themes you guys talked about today around happiness have to deal with public policy, politics, urban planning, healthcare. As individuals, what's one thing that we can do to increase happiness for ourselves? And then what's one thing that we can do to increase happiness for others, hmm. besides moving to Denmark? Mike, this, <laughs> Mike, this is definitely your question. I, I think Aristotle or Jeff said it earlier, friends. I mean, yeah. I, I think one of the clearest, most consistent patterns we see in the data is the importance of our relationships, loved ones, friends, family. Um, and that's also what you can do for others. You know, be a good friend, connect with people. Um, um, I think in the, the, the World Happiness Report, one of the, the questions collected by Gallup is, do you have somebody in your life you can rely on in times of need? Yes or no? That's a very sort of, um, it's a very simple question. You can also use you know, UCLA loneliness scale, 20 different questions that, that tries to capture what loneliness is. Um, but I think connecting with other people, creating strong communities, creating social fabric, caring about the ones that are uh, at the low end of the Cantrell ladder, uh, understanding that perhaps we should focus our efforts on where well-being is most scarce, uh, being somebody else, just the person you, they can rely on in times of need, uh, I think that would be my, my best universal advice. What to do for yourself and what to do for the others is the same. Be nice. nice. Give something. Uh, giving something is actually proven to be uh, enormously effective at raising your own feelings of well-being and doesn't hurt the receiver either. Uh, so I think that uh, it, it's really a powerful, uh, powerful antidote to uh, the, the kind of uh, aggressive uh, and, and uh, individualistic uh, social and cultural attitudes uh, that are pernicious and that have gotten out of hand. So we're going to have to stop here. Uh, I do, I, I'm sure we could talk for hours and answer hundreds of questions, but Jeff, Catalina, Mike, thank you. Uh, really good discussion. I'm Andrew Rubin. Thanks for, for joining us. Thank you.